Welcome. Thank you for joining our D Drive Electric Week virtual session, partnering across sectors to clean South Central Texas's air. I'm Aaron Choate, the president of Austin EV, the local chapter of the Electric Vehicle Association, and Laura Morrison is here today representing Texedera, the Texas Electric <coughs> Transportation Resources Alliance. She will present for roughly half an hour, and then we will open the floor for questions. Feel free to put your questions in the chat and I will share them or invite you to unmute so you can ask your question yourself. Okay, Laura, please go ahead and get started. I'll bring up your, your slides Thank now. You. There you go. So thank you for having me and um, really appreciate having the opportunity to to talk about this project and about Techcetra in general, because uh, we have it's an exciting time for electric transportation uh, across the globe, and in the U.S. and in Austin, um, and so um, it's fun to be able to be in front of some people that are interested in the topic. So I'm the executive director of what we call the Techcetra Education Fund. Um, and I'm here to talk about the, our project uh, you'll see over on the right, TechCetra, of course, stands for Texas Electric Transportation. The, uh, it's a project we're calling the Electric Transportation Compact, and it's focused in what we, what we refer to as South Central Texas region, but that's really everything around uh, Austin and San Antonio and in between. So um, next slide, slide please. Uh, so just a little introduction to the Education Fund. We are a 501c3 nonprofit that is basically working to um, move toward an electric transportation future for everybody. Um, and you may know the founders, have heard of the founders of this organization, uh, Tom Smitty Smith and um, Michael Osborne. We also have a, a sister organization, Techcetra, without the Education Fund, which is a C6, um, which is a member organization. And I see in our audience one of our board members, Joseph Barletta, who's on the board of Techcetra. Uh, it's made up of uh, utilities, ma uh, EV manufacturers, academic institutions, um, uh, EV drivers, environmental and consumer groups, <clears throat> charging companies. Um, and there's Joseph sending me little comments. Um, and um, <clears throat> it is, because <clears throat> it's a, a C6, it's able to engage in legislative advocacy. So there's a lot of action during the sessions and we have made a little bit of progress, slow but sure, um, up at the Capitol, so that's great. Um, okay, so next slide, please. So I'm sure you're all familiar with issues about transportation emissions, but just to remind you that Texas is the largest contributor to transportation related emissions um, across the US. Um, and uh, if you really look at all the issues that it um, creates for our, our society, obviously climate change is one, uh, air pollution, uh, it can impact economic vitality, public health, health costs, and environmental justice. And um, frankly, we need to, um, especially with re regard to environmental justice, I just want to mention that um, that low income communities and, and um, BIPOC communities, communities of color are disproportionately impacted by climate change, which is uh, gets to be a real issue. And we were just chatting um, the Austin, you all might be aware that the Austin Climate Equity Plan is in front of the Council for approval today. So um, it deals a lot with environmental justice issues around that. So it, um, electric transportation certainly is one part of addressing uh, transportation related emissions. Obviously, there's multimodal. Um, there's all sorts of other ways to deal with the fact that we have so much in the way of um, uh, so many transportation emissions. Um, land use is one, making sure we do telecommuting, things like that. But um, electric transportation is certainly a big part of it. And you may, I'm sure you've been watching some of the data that's been coming out about uh, how quickly sales of electric vehicles are 
are happening and growing now. In fact, um, in July, uh, Texas had its biggest month of EV sales, 3,382. It was the biggest month on record, and it was the second state behind California. Uh, We now have, I think, 95,000 electric vehicles in Texas. And um, if you look across all light duty, 5% in the nation, 5% of all the light duty vehicles, that includes pickups, et cetera, uh, were electric in July. But if you look at just the passenger vehicles, actually 20%. So those numbers are going up really quickly. And obviously when when, um, pickups come out, it's really gonna go up a lot more. Um, So just wanted to mention, we were talking about the equity climate plan that's in front of the um, council right now. And you'll probably be hearing more about that tomorrow, I understand, but I was on the advisory group for that. And uh, we have a very, very bold um, goal for electric transportation. And that is that that by 2030, 40% of all the vehicle miles traveled in the Austin area will be electric. That's that's 40% of all vehicle miles traveled, not just sales, which really means that we need to be converting almost 100% of our sales later uh, to electric by the end of, of the decade. Okay, next slide, please. Um, and I just want to mention this, there's some interesting, um, you know, we work in this compact project with um, uh, with uh, corporations and large institutions and private companies. And so a lot of what we need to be thinking about is uh, the financial benefits of reducing or the uh, financial impacts of transportational related emissions. And in fact, um, non-attainment, being in non-attainment can be very, very costly uh, in economic damage, and then this this number, 27.5 billion economic damage, is the potential that was uh, from a study that the Alamo area COG did um, a few years ago about the potential for economic damage uh, over a lifetime of non-attainment in the San, San Antonio area. And obviously, moving to electric for your fleets, et cetera, can really decrease the cost of operations. And um, uh, another thing, of course, is a healthier future. Um, premature death, the premature death, and the cost of healthcare has been estimated from uh, by the American Lung Association, um, and they looked at a, a zero emissions future scenario, and have determined um, the cost that we, cost impacts that we'll be avoiding, and it's on the order of. $2 billion in health impacts, um, 182 deaths, and 3,600 asthma deaths in, um, in the state of Texas that w- can be avoided if we move to an electric transportation future. Next slide, please. So now to move on to this project of reduce it, the um, South Central Texas Electric Transportation Compact Um, which is a public-private partnership that we're putting together to pull together government, large employers, educational institutions, all to work collectively on reducing transportation-related emissions in the Austin-San Antonio region. Um, And we are very fortunate to have the leadership of co-chairs Bridget Shea, who you probably know is a commissioner here in Travis County, and in Bear County, Commissioner Justin Rodriguez. Um, and they are, um, uh, they have provided great model le- le- leadership for us, and we're fortunate to have them. We're also fortunate to um, have funding in part um, from the Energy Foundation, which um, is just uh, starting its second year now. Next slide, please. So basically, we pull together, we're pulling people, people together, these institutions and entities working collectively on how we can all um, uh, reduce the emissions. And obviously that's looking at electrifying their fleets and importantly, finding ways to uh, reduce the um, employee commutes in single occupancy ICE vehicles. 
Um, and uh, that can be from public transportation, which hopefully we're going to be getting a lot more of electric public transportation here in, in the city of Austin, telecommuting and alternative scheduling. You probably heard that Travis County, again, under the leadership of Bridget Shea, is moving towards 75% telecommuting. Um, and then encouraging transition to electric vehicles among their employees as much as possible um, work, with workplace charging and education and access programs. Next slide, please. So um, as, you, as we think about pulling folks together, there are a number of benefits that uh, we have the opportunity to sort of bring forward together. Obviously, for each of the, uh, the participants, um, sustainability goals are going to be impacted by reducing uh, transportation and emis emissions, and pretty much everybody uh, is paying some attention to that right now, so that's good. It has the potential to, um, to uh, find some financial savings if they're going to be um, reducing fuel costs and maintenance costs with an electric fleet. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that and also about how it can improve the quality of life and morale of employees if you get workplace charging and really a, a vibrant sort of EV culture in your um, uh, organization. But we've also found that uh, pulling folks together has really um, created, is starting to create an opportunity to uh, exchange information and think about things together and cooperate in, in some of the challenges that they have. Um, and we are fortunate to have some wonderful nonprofits in, um, in, in the nation, actually, that we're able to bring uh, to bear. And then um, another issue that is an interesting idea that we are potentially looking at monetizing the collective outcomes, i.e., if we can get uh, the carbon reductions into a carbon market and then share the proceeds of that. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute too. Next slide, please. Just a couple of examples uh, about electrifying fleets um, and the potential to save money. Um, I'm sure you've read about Amazon, UPS, etc. that are turning to electric vehicles because of the cost, potential cost savings. Um, uh, for, from fuel and maintenance. Um, and it's interesting because I know that both, I've heard from both Frito-Lay, which is also PepsiCo, by the way, and HEB, and it's interesting to look at what they're doing because they are, um, uh, they have enormous diverse fleets. And so they're looking at everything from the forklifts in their warehouses to the semis. Um, and, and doing pilot pro programs and really moving that along. They're also looking at um, uh, distributed generation, i.e. getting solar on their, on their rooftops of, say, their warehouses and um, energy, co-locating energy storage. So that's going to bring, again, more fuel savings, cost of energy, um, and build in some resilience, which is important, obviously, in business continuity for them. And then over on the right, I have a uh, slide from the City of Austin um, fleet presentation a couple of years ago. Um, they were given a goal, the fleet was given a goal to uh, have 5% of their fleet electric by the end of 2020, I think, maybe 2021. Um, and you can see the savings opportunity that they were looking at from just <clears throat> over five years, from just five, uh, 10 years, from just 5% of their goal, which was $3.5 million, which is going to, um, is, is going to be very meaningful <clears throat> in a budget, for sure. And that's only 5%. I also don't have it here, but I uh, saw a report some time ago about a New York City um, governmental department that had switched to light duty electric quite a bit, quite a while ago. And their number in terms of what they were uh, experiencing and cost savings what, on maintenance was it was only, their maintenance costs were only 25% of what they had been before. So there's a lot of opportunity um, that the folks that we're talking with in the compact are interested in being able to capture in terms of uh, financial savings. 
Um, okay, next slide, please. And the other one I wanted to, um, other thing I wanted to talk about just a little bit is workplace charging. Um, the um, it's important, and I think more and more entities are starting to understand that we're, that uh, their employee commutes are part of their responsibility scope three emissions according to the EPA. So they are do have some um, responsibility for them. Um, so the concern, of course, is going to be what about cost to the employer and what are the benefits? ChargePoint did a cost um, a case study of cost. Um, in a particular situation, and they found that the cost per user um, uh, was $450, and when you line that up with other benefits that can be provided, it's about the same order of magnitude of coffee service. So it's important to keep that in mind that it doesn't have to be hugely expensive. Um, and on the, on the flip side of that, there are a lot of benefits that come from it. Uh, first of all is employee satisfaction and retention. It can mean a tremendous amount to some employees. Um, I, should, I should mention we did a, you know, one of the things that uh, we hear is people say, well, why do for workplace charging? Because everybody that has an electric vehicle charges at home. Um, we did, TechCetra did a survey uh, in March of last year. We got quite a good turnout. I bet you guys were some of the <laughs> Some of the respondents, um, it was a statewide survey, and um, we asked where they found that, um, but first of all, we asked if you had uh, home charging, and secondly, where would you like to see, where would it be useful to have more charging? 95% of our respondents had charging at home. At the same time, more than half of them still found that workplace charging would be useful. So it's important to keep in mind that uh, the convenience that it can add uh, can be quite an amenity for employees. But also, and I think more importantly, is the fact that it's going to be very significant to many employees when we think about really um, uh, vast uh, adoption of electric vehicles, because you, you probably know in the city of Austin, um, I think about half the people rent. A good portion of those, if not more, um, live in multifamily, and that can be condos or it can be um, apartments, which are less likely to have um, charging. So it might make, so what we call garage orphans, um, it might, might make electric vehicle driving feasible for them. Um, but also it's important to remember that um, it would be useful for people that, are, that have very long commutes, which more and more people in the Austin area have, and for people who are driving shorter range uh, electric vehicles, especially say as more and more used EVs come on the market. And then lastly, um, I think it's important to think about the fact that for lower income employees to be able to get into an electric vehicle and have it be feasible for them with, for instance, workplace charging in case, for instance, they live in an apartment building that doesn't have um, doesn't have charging uh, there, um, the savings that a lower income person is going to have or in dollar amount, the same amount as somebody else, but in terms of the uh, percent of their income, it's much higher. And so it can have, it can be a way for an employer to actually bring, um, I like to think of it as sort of a virtual raise to their lower income and uh, lower their employees on the lower pay scale. Um, okay, next slide, please. I think that was the last slide, I hope. You went in the other direction. Yeah, next slide. Yeah, bingo. So um, we had an intern do a study for us on the potential value of the collective for uh, South Central Texas emissions, and this is just short haul vehicles in a carbon market. So let's say we took everybody, we got all the short haul vehicles in our uh, region to go electric, how much would that reduce the, uh, the carbon emissions? And secondly then, the next step was, how much could that be worth of value on a carbon market? 
Um, and this is sort of just to give us a feel for the <clears throat> concept of monetization. And you can see, and obviously there's lots of assumptions in here. Uh, it's based on the e EPA model uh, uh, for emissions that TCEQ did and then sort of stretched out with no electric transportation in the scenario. And of course, we had to make some guesses about a carbon market. And this is one um, set of numbers with a, I mean, this is a set of numbers, dollar values with a certain uh, carbon value that we thought was not unreasonable. Uh, and you can see that collectively it's worth billions of dollars. Um, this is color coded by county down below. And it's sort of interesting. You can see that uh, Travis and Bear are the, are the biggest counties. But interestingly, um, Williamson starts growing more, uh, more Hayes County starts growing more. And that sort of just says more people are coming to our region and more um, people will be living uh, in outlying uh, more suburban areas. Um, but all to say that it can be a very important motivating factor to say, hey, if we're smart about this and we start really uh, getting baselines in place so we know how much we're reducing with our efforts, we can put these together, aggregate them potentially in a carbon market in the future and make some money off of it. Okay, next slide. So uh, we've had, uh, we, we've put together an advisory committee and had our first meeting this summer. We're planning to meet about quarterly. And um, you can see that we had a good, um, a good spread of types of um, types of entities, city, county, large employers, manufacturers, uh, school districts, transit agencies, universities, utilities, and lots of support folks that are very interested in helping us with this. And uh, we, we will be um, looking to have our next one um, in November, I think is the plan. Um, but it was an interesting meeting. It was the first one. People didn't really know what we were doing. Um, and sort of curious and all, we had some great conversation that came out of it and some good ideas about, number one, more information that's needed in certain areas for folks and um, how to get started on things. And then ideas that came out of it um, that I'll talk about a little later that we're moving on in terms of how to cooperate and specific things that could be very low cost that uh, folks can do. So we were pleased with the outcome of that. Um, one of the, um, next slide please, one of the other things that's come out of our efforts um, already is um, a, uh, a joint county resolution that was passed on June 15 uh, by both Bear and Travis County Commissioners, and it was pretty exciting. Both of them said, uh, this was obviously with um, Commissioners, um, under the leadership of Commissioners uh, Rodriguez and Shay, um, in terms of wanting to be leaders in being able to show how you can move toward uh, electrifying your fleet and taking the right steps to actually do it. Because what we found in talking with people is that there's certainly a lot of interest in uh, electrifying fleets, uh, a lot of intention to do it. Um, some of the some of the challenge is knowing how to get started and actually thinking through it adequately so you can be successful and do it efficiently and future proof what you're doing. So um, I want to talk about a little bit about each one of them. Bear County, if you go to the next page, Bear County and Travis County were in very different starting places. Um, Bear County had yet to do, had not yet done a um, greenhouse gas inventory for their, for their organization. And so they said, hey, the first thing we need to do is get that baseline in inventory and figure out what, our, what impact our fleet is having on our emissions. Um, but yes, we certainly understand that fleet electrification could well be, um, is in our future. So the second part of it was to say, let's look at the cost benefits and understand um, uh, how charging infrastructure would work, et cetera look at what we would need to change when it comes to procurement and other considerations, 
um, and then come back and get an approval to actually move forward. And I can tell you that for both Bear and for Travis County, one of the real motivating factors for them was that um, uh, was that there it, there's a lot of state grant money. There's going to be a lot more um, a lot more federal money in terms of grants uh, for electric transportation, and these grant these grants open up and and without much notice. And they sometimes have very short uh, deadlines. And unless you really know like where you're headed and what you need and what could fit in to your next purchase, uh, it's very difficult to, um, to actually take advantage of those grants. So uh, Bayer is still working on this effort <clears throat> and we're looking forward to hearing back from them uh, in the near future. Whereas Travis County already had a greenhouse gas inventory they already knew that 25% um, of their greenhouse gas emissions came from their fleet. And by the way, about the same amount came from their, um, from their employee commute. So um, next slide. So they were, next slide please. They were ready to jump in and they passed, their resolution was more specific. They said, we are going to electrify our fleet. Um, and what we want to do is put together we want staff to go off and put together a plan, a comprehensive plan for how we do that, not only how we get started, but you know how we're going to move through that in the future. And I have to say their, um, their staff are rock stars. They have done so much good work. They, um, and, and I think it's next week, their staff will be coming back to the, to the commissioners for uh, approval of their plan. Um, and they basically have really, um, they sat down with the Electrification Coalition. If you don't know about them, you should. They're a great resource. They have a lot of, not only do they have a purchasing cooperative but for public entities, but they have folks that will sit down at the table with you and help you through, through like doing the fleet analysis uh, to review and, um, and guidance on how to put um, a plan together. Uh, they do have some uh, some best practices that um, Travis County staff have followed uh, for putting a plan together. And it's interesting, um, you know, what they came up with is what they're going to be telling the commissioners next week is we are planning to create our plan because, and this is what we're doing to go through it. Um, and if you look at number three, number three is the, op three and four are like the obvious ones, right? They're like, oh, we're gonna electrify our fleet. We need to figure out what we'll replace and what the infrastructure is. But you can see that to get a successful comprehensive plan in place, it takes a lot more. You need to look at what policies need to be evaluated and who the real stakeholders are to be successful um, and then get into prioritizing the budget, deal with the fact that maintenance people um, might need to be uh, retrained and users and drivers um, and then put into place a long-term strategy for managing the whole process of transitioning. And it's especially fun to see them do, do this because when I was working on helping them draft the, the resolution, I was searching through some of their previous resolutions and I found one from 1993 that said by 2001, we want 70% 7, of our um, fleet to be zero emissions or low emissions. And of course, th that was their priority and nothing happened because they didn't put a plan in place. They didn't ask for accountability. So this time, um, they're looking to do it in a really smart way. Um, next slide, please. And I just this is um, also from what they'll be um, presenting next week, and that is a, uh, a list of all the, I mean, it's a lot more, you'll be able to see their stuff on their, their on the, the backup that they're going to be presenting on their uh, agenda page, but it has a list of all the stakeholders that they engaged. Um, the Sheriff's Office, they're, re they're ready to go. Um, the other planning and budget, obviously, that's going to have a lot to do, have a lot of impact in this, and facilities management is certainly at the table uh, with regard to where the charging stations are going to be. Um, but you also look at things like the auditor and human resources. You know, human resources and um, 
in terms of uh, how they're going to be reimbursed if they take um, if they take uh, if employees take their fleet the electric fleet vehicle home and park it overnight things like that which quickly gets into this list of policies that they turned up that really might be impacted some more than others. Um, so it's a, a bit, it's really an exciting start that they've gotten. They've already applied for <laughs> and been denied a couple of grants, unfortunately. Um, but this this gives them this foundation gives them the uh, confidence that what they're um, along with their their sort of outline of what kinds of electric vehicles are available now that would be good replacements cost wise and things like that. Uh, gives them a lot of confidence that they're moving forward in the right direction. So that joint county resolution, hopefully, uh, we're intending to to work uh, with the smaller um, counties in between Austin and San Antonio with the Corridor Council, if you're familiar with that organization, to be working with the, the uh, folks there uh, with the leadership of um, Bridget and Justin. Um, sort of saying, hey, this is how you can do it. You know, either you get started with your baseline and then move forward, or if you already have your baseline and know what you're working on, here's how you can put um, here's how you can put a, a plan in place and be ready to take advantage of the billions of dollars that's going to be coming down, hopefully, from uh, Washington soon. Um, so next slide, please. And this is my um, last slide. I just wanted to talk about um, the other kinds of conversations that are coming out of uh, the advisory group discussion uh, and other work in the compact. Um, today, um, the city council, in addition to considering their um, the climate plan, they're also, this first bullet, they're also going to be looking at a resolution sponsored by Leslie Poole to um, ask staff to come up with strategies to accelerate employee EV adoption because there are opportunities for discounts um, that either Austin Energy can do and, and you know, edu education that they can do, but also there can be discounts potentially with, um, with companies out there, there that are either leasing or selling, um, selling equipment. Um, and then that, uh, one of the ideas that came out of our advisory committee meeting was the second one, and that is whether or not public entities might be able to share um, charging infrastructure um, in, in, in the region instead of the county needing a full set, the AISD needing a full set of charging um, cap metro. And so that was um, Commissioner Trevelyan brought that idea up, and I know that um, uh, uh, Leslie Poole is working with this office to see about whether that could move forward. Um, also talking with UT as part of that conversation, and obviously are going to need to be talking, uh, well, they are sort of, I mean, Jeff and Leslie are on the board of Cap Metro, so they already know that there's a couple of Cap Metro board members who want to look into it, but also to look at whether or not that's a feasible thing, whether legally or financially how it would be handled operationally, how it would be handled. But it's a really um, important thing to consider in terms of maybe saving our public entity some money. Um, this uh, university parking garage uh, issue really comes out of um, something that's, that when we were working with the University of Austin, uh, UT Austin, and as early stages of um, the compact with UT San Antonio, um, all of a sudden, the idea came out of let's let's pull in other UT campuses and see if it, there isn't some collective action we could do. And so, there's some real um, progress being made there. Um, school districts are certainly looking at um, transitioning. AISD is very aggressively looking for opportunities. Unfortunately, uh, right now they need grant funding, and the grant hasn't come up, but they're planning for it already. And then also in the near future, some of the folks will be uh, publicly taking um, EV ready code, for instance, Austin, that might be um, taken to uh, the full council in the near future. Um, and then lastly, I want to mention that um, we've just been funded actually to do the same kind of work in the Dallas-Fort Worth region. And we're looking, we're, we're excited to look at 
that possibility. I know there's a lot of great work going on in Dallas-Fort Worth with like the Dallas um, Clean Cities Program and the North Central Texas uh, Council of Governments. They both, they're sort of one and the same. They do great work with electric transportation and everything. So we're looking forward to really sort of coordinating with them and, and seeing how we can help raise the level in the areas where they haven't um, had the opportunity to um, focus, you know, whether it's specifically school districts or specifically some of the private companies um, that need more work. Um, so next slide, I think that's the last one. Yes. Um, so anyways, it's sort of, it's, a, it's an exciting um, project. We have, um, you know, it's sort of develop, developing and evolving in terms of just to meet the needs of the um, needs of the different folks that we're bringing to the table, but also to help provide guidance and resources um, wherever we can. So with that, I will stop talking and take some questions. So I'll go ahead and if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat or um, simply indicate that you have a question in the chat and I'll ask you to unmute. And so, um, Matthew, I'm going to ask you to unmute here. Uh, terrific. So you can see my question. I just hope you could give us a quick teaching overview of the different uh, legal entities, you know, city, county, cap metro. What are their different uh, regulatory authorities and revenue opportunities that they can apply to the world of transit? How do those and any other entity that you consider a key player that must be mentioned too. And are you talking specifically about transit? Yeah, I thought I'd just focus on transit. You know, that okay. is the, <laughs> an electrification right. of fleets or, you know, so, you know, it's yeah, a question right. about opportunity, but also, you know, who's responsible for what and what are the revenues that they can apply to this challenge? Right. Um, okay. So, uh, so, you know, Cap Metro gets some of our sales tax in in the Cap Metro areas, and so Austin is in that area, um, and uh, other outlying areas are in that area. Um, so they have funding from that. Sometimes they have funding revenue from fares. Uh, they get grant um, funding. Their fare revenue is not that big. Um, the city of Austin, and so Cap Metro has a board, and the city of Austin uh, has a couple of um, council members on that board. So they have some kinds of they have some kind of um, say in policy and direction and budget for Cap Metro. The county also has some seats on the board, i.e., um, Jeff Trevelyan is on the board. And so, um, and now with um, Project Connect, which is huge, I think it was at $7 billion that we uh, approved uh, to go to Cap Metro to build out um, uh, public transit and light rail in the city, which will be electric and zero emission. Um, that there's a new body that was created called the Austin Partnership for Transit, um, and um, maybe somebody can tell me, I think it's a local government, I forget what they're called, uh, entity. It's sort of a, it's an unelected board, but they actually, given the bylaws that were passed um, by the city, um, were able to, they, they have their own, um, their, their own authority, and they get the revenue from, um, they get revenue from the bond that the city passed. So the money flows from the city bond to the transit folks. And obviously Cap Metro is part of that. Um, Cap Metro, you might've heard just bought, they just made the largest electric um, bus purchase ever made in the nation, 200 buses, I think it was, which is, which is really incredible. And they have, uh, I know they've worked very closely with Austin Energy um, to build out a major charging facility uh, at the old mattress factory in Northeast Austin. And, you know, another 
revenue potential that should be considered is that, that comes from all of this is Austin Energy is going to be sell, selling a whole lot more electricity because of this. So it's uh, it's important for us to realize that um, you know utilities like electric transportation because it is a revenue opportunity. So I don't did that answer your question, Matthew? I'm not sure. I I, I really was. It was, did. Hold on a second. Let me. He had a okay. follow up. So I, and he okay. muted himself. So so county has a small role in transit. Um. Okay. Couldn't unmute yeah, I, again. Yeah, I'm unmuted again. Yeah, but, okay. Yeah, that's my question. It's just like the county's role in, in the transit uh, landscape. Um, so I think they have one, and I might be wrong about this. So it's a it's a, it's about the um, really the roles are having people on the board, right? The Cat Metro board, and mm -hmm. I I'm not sure if they have two also, but they're also non elected officials on that Cat Metro board, um, and so. Uh, it's really sort of that role. I know that there were bigger ties between, um, you know, I used to be on the city council and there was all this complicated quarter cent, quarter cent tax issue where Cat Metro was actually, they, they, they got um, by voter approval a certain percentage of the sales tax and then they agreed to give back some of it to the city of Austin. And so there were there were close ties because there was that flow of revenue. I think that that flow is gone now. I think that was time limited, and I don't think anything like that was with the with the county. But um, but obviously, with the city uh, funding the 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 Project Connect through their bonds, that actually you know that obviously puts them in a tighter financial tie to Cat Metro than the county. And I could. Um, there, there might be some things I'm missing about uh, in terms of the county's relationship there. So that needs to be a cap, uh, caveat. Okay, very good. Thank you. Sure. Hey, um, Steve, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, uh, thank you, Laura. That was uh, very informative. I, I was curious about, you mentioned on a slide, other than the stuff about the county, and that's all great, that there was several large um, uh, company or companies that do deliveries, I guess, in the area, that are interested or, or that were uh, that you, you just mentioned, and then I don't remember if you mentioned anything else about it. But I was curious about what do those companies want from the city or the state to help them electrify? Um, money, <laughs> because <laughs> when you look at um, when you look at total cost of ownership. Um, for a lot of the um, medium and heavy duty vehicles, um, long term, it makes sense. You're, you get uh, an ROI, but the upfront cost is more. And so just getting over that barrier of the upfront cost. And so having opportunities for grants, and it looks like there's a potential from the, in the what's being considered in Washington right now, that there will be more medium and heavy duty. I understand uh, uh, grant uh, support. And of course, the other thing is if the feds convert to electric fleets, including the post office, that creates a whole new huge demand for medium and heavy duty, which help moves, helps to move the market along. And uh, so that can help cost actually bring it down. Um, and um, I, I'm not sure if you may have heard of the, um, there's two main um, funding mechanisms through the state right now um, for electric transportation. One of them is $200 million that came from the VW settlement um, that got split up state by state and we got, Texas got $200 million. And there are, like right now, they're about to, and I'm sure Joseph knows a lot about this, Right now, they're about to open a uh, $20 million grant program for uh, fast charges, fast DC fast chargers, um, which can be very expensive to put in. But they are important to, you know, like if you've got delivery folks going along that aren't necessarily around, that aren't necessarily going to be um, relying on their own, own fleet charging, uh, to have more charging is going to be helpful 
for them. And certainly if you start getting out on the highways, right? Um, so there's that. There's also the Texas Emissions Reduction Plan Program, otherwise known as TERP, that C, uh, TCQ um, administers. And that is a bunch of different kinds of grants. You can look it up and you'll see a whole list of, they might have like 10 different kinds of grants. The good news about that, and that's where, for instance, when you buy a light duty vehicle, uh, electric vehicle, you get uh, $2,500 back from the state. That's that's a TERP grant. Um, and the good news about that is it is funded by uh, a, a fee that we pay when we register our car. And the legislature used to grab some of that money uh, and use it for other things. And two years ago, there was legislation that said you can't grab that anymore. It all has to go to TERP. And this year, this legislative session, they said, oh, yes, we can. We can still grab some of that money, but we promise we won't grab as much. All to say that the, num the amount of money coming to our TERP programs and our grant opportunities through the state are going to go um, way up. So there's grant opportunities. Um, ah, what else do these companies need from the state? I mean, the grants are the obvious thing in the first place. I imagine, um, you know, when it comes to local, I can tell you that um, that there's a there can be a problem in terms of permitting time uh, to get your charging infrastructure in. That would be uh, an issue. Those are a couple of things that just jump. Um, so following up on that, a, a few months ago, I think this this particular group uh, had a, another fellow who was uh, <clears throat> also involved in the same sort of things you're involved, and he had mentioned that uh, some of these these companies wanted. Uh, chargers that were had a much larger capacity to handle trucks and you know, mm -hmm. think be in the megawatt range as opposed to kilowatt range. And I, I was wondering uh, that that struck me as needing a partnership with the, the state and the utilities because you know that's a lot more power. And I was wondering if there's been any further movement along that lines to help those companies with the charging infrastructure. So you bring up an interesting point, and not only if you have, you know, mega, you know, go to that kind of power levels and things like that, are you going to need help from utilities? You're going to need help, you know, even with the technology that we have now, et cetera. And so um, one of the things that um, one of the things that's really important that the state needs to do, um, and is to do some planning to encourage charging, fast charging, uh, you know, all along our all of our major highways and things like that. And it makes sense to do some initial planning to incentivize it to get it in the right place. Uh, because you want to make sure that you're um, that you're placing your chargers out on I-10 where you've got transmission um, Tr transmission and distribution capacity already so you can use do it mo most consistently um, and the other um, and most effectively efficiently I mean because uh, you want to make the most use you can of the utility infrastructure that's already there um, I know that Austin Energy of course is really terrific they do they they're doing modeling that says where are EVs going to be uh, growing in the city and where they're going and where do we need to be thinking about increasing our transmission distribution and all of that. And I should mention that in the federal infrastructure bill, we're going to be getting $408 million in the state for charging generally like to fill, to try to get fast charging every 50 miles along our highways. That's our interstates, our federal and state highways, our evacuation routes, we need them at our border crossings and things like that. So that concept of having a plan in place uh, to know where we need it and how to and encourage people to put the charging, you know, scattered around so you can go everywhere uh, is something that the state could do for us. And we encourage them to do that. We at TechCetera actually did a map that overlaid how would you do a fast charger every 50 miles aligned with existing utilities. So we've sort of got a, a bare bones of that already. And in the, um, in the omnibus bill that we had offered 
and and actually got adopted by the transportation committee in the house last year and made it a ways one of the pieces was to have the state come together and uh, agencies but also all interested parties to try and put that plan together but that didn't pass I wanted to go ahead. So I think the, the question got answered, but I wanted to make sure that it got onto the stream. The, the question was related to whether or not the, it, it's great to see that the city is looking to add more electric vehicles to their fleet. Is there anything in the conversations uh, about having the power offset by renewable resources such as solar or wind? And then Matthews um, shared in the chat that um, the city of Austin is looking to be uh, essentially net zero um, by 2035, um, or at least carbon free. Uh, did you did you have anything you wanted to share beyond that? Yeah, let me just. I bet um, I would ask Joseph to talk about co-locating or or offsetting. Um, just in terms of the city, it's it's actually it's going to be net zero by 2040, which in the plan, which moves it up from 2050. So that's a big deal. Um, and the interesting thing when you look at the emissions. Austin Energy is on the path to get us there for Austin Energy. And so maybe that's what the 2035 is that we're looking at. But if you look at the projection for the emissions for transportation, they're just flat. They're gonna be like essentially 90% of our emissions if we don't move to electric um, because it's at 40% right now. Austin Energy is going way, their, their part of it is going way down. So um, that's one of the great things about driving electric in the city of Austin, because if you drive electric and all your energy comes from a coal plant, you're not having quite the uh, carbon impact, uh, at, at the beneficial impact as you would if you're driving here where we're, we have such clean energy. But Joseph, can you talk about the other? Um, Joseph, let me unmute you. Sure. Uh, I was answering uh, Mark's question uh, earlier on the uh, federal rest stops uh, and just alluding to the fact that the rest stops are not state owned, they are federally owned. Um, and when you start to mix state and federal layers, uh, when it comes to, you know, suggestions on EV infrastructure, uh, it is a good idea because most of the rest stops are uh, kind of in, in, induced on the highway corridors and the transmission lines. So it'd be a perfect match and they are relevant, I guess, the frequency at which those locations are scattered throughout the state are already there, they're already existing. So it would make no, uh, it, it would definitely make sense if we were to get this federal fund uh, funding from the federal government that they would elicit, like kind of open up the, the door for us to be able to add, the, you know, said charging infrastructure at the at these rest stops. I think it'd be, it'd be amazing. I think that'd definitely be a right step uh, in the state of Texas and, and, and being at a pace to follow that. Um, but as far as the question goes, go ahead and repeat it so I can uh, I can go ahead and get a, a, give kind of a better answer to it. Laura, what, what was you what is it you wanted him to address? It was the question of uh, so using solar and wind um, to create the electricity, the extra electricity that we're going to be using with electric vehicles. I think that, you know, I'm, I'm just seeing this, Daniela, in the chat here. It was, yeah, Austin Energy is on track to be carbon free by 2035. So um, you'll be good to go <laughs> if, you're, if you're getting your um, fuel um, from Austin Energy for your car. Great. Okay, I'm gonna, there are a couple of additional questions, but I, I, we're getting close to the hour. So I wanted to go ahead and shut us down. Um, thank you for joining us today, Laura. We really appreciate it. Um, where's the best place for our attendees to keep track of this work? Um, well, our, our website is not too informative yet. I would, uh, we are gonna have a TechCetra Ed Fund uh, website that I'm not ready to send you to yet. There is, but if you go to techcetra.org, um, you can sign up for the newsletter. If you join, uh, you get put on the newsletter, which is very informative and um, uh, will keep some of this um, also. And by the way, um, I'm noticing in the chat, Aaron, the, um, the light duty, everything expired 
the the TERP grant, everything expired, and they're just opening it up again. They will open up the light duty again. It's it's oh, still ex exists as a grant program, and I think it can be retroactive. So you, if you bought your car in the time it was closed, you can still go get one. Okay, so it was it renewed. Opened. That's good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. All those grant programs stayed, that they changed a little bit, and now it's a matter of they just have to open them up, which is a lot of signatures apparently. <laughs> Well, thanks again. Um, I want to remind everybody that this is one of several sessions that we're doing for Drive Electric Week. So to see the full agenda, you can go to austinev.org. And as a reminder, we strive to make all of our local activities open and free to join. Um, and all EVs and EV enthusiasts are welcome. But if you want to support our efforts, please consider joining the Electric Vehicle Association through the link that you will find on our site and select our group as your chapter. For as little as $35, you can help support our access to the core services we use to coordinate our events. And have a great Drive Electric Week.